I now have the opportunity to introduce to you someone who uh, is so amazing that uh, I will introduce him twice today. The, the second time will be after lunch uh, on a panel. And uh, at this point, uh, all I'd like to say is that he is not only a legend in American entertainment, he not only is a leader in philanthropy and social change, but I love him to death and I am so thrilled that he's here with us today. Please welcome Norman Lear. Thank you, Marty. <clears throat> I, I never hear um, myself lauded that way uh, without uh, thinking of being reminded of my mother. Uh, had I called her to tell her about this uh, event and it was taking place at a place called the Lear Center, she would have reacted, I'm confident, as she did when I called her to tell her that the uh, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences was starting a, uh, a hall of fame and that I was gonna be among the first inductees. And when I called her one Sunday morning and I said, Mom, uh, it's, uh, it's William Paley and David Sarnoff and uh, Milton Berle and Lucille Ball and Edward R. Murrow and Patty Chayefsky and me. And she said, listen, if that's what they wanna do, who am I to say? <laughs> So had I told her I was coming to a center that bore my name, she did the same thing. You know, I learned, uh, uh, but it's one of the lessons in life from putting something like this together. You, uh, you, you have to start with somebody that uh, uh, everybody knows and respects and wishes to meet if they haven't met him, uh, wishes to uh, uh, be with them if they haven't met him or her, in this case, a him. And everything started uh, when the brilliant people who put all of this together decided, let's see if Tom Ford will join us. So Tom, thank you. You're the centerpiece here. Everybody wished to be a part of this because you were a part of it. And I am introducing Mr. Ford now by way of telling you that he started with a degree in architecture at Parsons School of Design and uh, in Paris and then later in New York. In 1990, he joined Gucci in Milan as the company's women's wear designer. In 1992, he became the design director for Gucci. 94, the creative director, which meant that he was responsible for the design of all the product lines from clothing to perfumes from the group's corporate image, advertising campaigns, and store design. In 2000, following Gucci's acquisition of Yves Saint Laurent, he assumed the position of creative director for the whole shebang. In 2002, he became vice chairman of the entire Gucci group. Tom Ford's success has been recognized again and again and again. Three award counts, uh, awards for the, from the Council of Fashion Designers of America, five VH1 Vogue Fashion Awards, the L Style Award, GQ International Man of the Year Award, Time Magazine Designer of the Year, and the most recent uh, Fashion Designer Achievement Award at Cooper Union. Could not be more pleased and proud to have Tom Ford here. He will be talking with Guy Treve. Guy Treve is a fashion reporter, which uh, is in Guy Treve's uh, uh, sense uh, misleading because he is far more than a fashion reporter. Uh, he he's a, reports for the New York Times, but uh, he's an astute observer of the culture generally. And while he does indeed report on the latest development in the fashion world uh, and in the fashion capitals of the world, he also identifies and explains other trends that influence fashion, such as the role of hip hop performers as an engine of new fashion trends, the role of the street as a constant source of inspiration for new fashion ideas. Before joining uh, the New York Times in 2000, Guy Trebay was a columnist at the Village Voice, where he covered New York for two decades. 
He was written for many national magazines from the New Yorker, Esquire, Harper's, and many others. A collection of his stories about New York City called In the Place to Be and many other. It was published in 1994, among many other books. He has received many awards, including Columbia University's Meyer Berger Award, twice in 92 and 2000, and uh, the Deadline Club Front Page Award. Guy has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, moderating these two amazing gentlemen is Laurie Racine, who is the center of uh, everything that has occurred here to bring us all together. Uh, she is a, uh, a PhD uh, and a fellow at the uh, Lear Center. So please, won't you step up on the stage, Laurie Racine, Guy Trebay, and Tom w Ford. <laughs> by Norman Lear, I can go home. Yeah. Um, it is with great pleasure <coughs> that we are joined today by Guy Trebay and um, uh, Tom Ford. And I must say that I consider both of them culturalists in the highest regard, given their individual fields of endeavor, but with a, an eye and a, an understanding of the world at large that few of us have. It's, it, I think their appreciation of fashion and fashion's relationship to our larger cultural dynamic will be incredible. So um, what we're about to do here today is to delve into kind of uncharted territory where, as David alluded to, we're going to use fashion as a, a stepping stone to explore different aspects of creativity, imitation, originality, homage and inspiration. And we want to talk about fashion with a little f. Not the magnificent creations that Tom has given the world, nor the um, wonderful, insightful observations and dissections of those collections and others that Guy has uh, weaved into splendid prose. Rather, we're, we want to give this discussion a larger framing. What we're looking to do is to look at a whole spectrum of <coughs> themes that have come from fashion. We were looking at the art, the craft, the business, the lifestyle, the marketing, and the standards of practice in fashion uh, that are mentioned many times based in law or actually not in law. <coughs> Hopefully what I'm going to do here is very, very little. I want to play the role of kind of the wacky therapist, you know, throw something out there and say, okay, go at it, boys, you know. So, um, that, that's, if, if I'm successful, that would, will happen. Hopefully these gentlemen have very strong feelings about what we're going to talk about. And if they don't, I'm sure they're going to make it up magnificently. You'll never we'll be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things I'm interested in starting with is this idea of creativity and something um, that was alluded to about what is originality in its relationship to creativity in, in fashion. If fashion is in fact derivative at its core, then is it actually an original art form? David, I loved your, your presentation. Uh, there is a Coco Chanel quote that you did not use, which I love, and uh, it is that creativity is the art of concealing your source, <laughs> which I think is, is, is amazing. But anyway, to get back to what uh, your question was, I don't know if Guy, do you want to take that first or? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of want to raise you one on the, on the Chanel because there's a Picasso that says the mediocre right. artists borrow and great artists steal. And I think that's, <laughs> that kind of is what interests me about the way that fashion works right now, that it's, uh, that appropriation is so normalized inside of fashion. And I, it, it, may be, it, may, it may have been quite different for you in, in no, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that it's been a trend. I mean, I think appropriation's always been a trend. I mean, David, you didn't go all the way back to, you know, Madame Recamier and, and empire dresses, and that have been, been you know, uh, inspired by the Greeks. And I mean, it's just something that's been with us for a long time. And, but for the last 10 years in particular, I think as, as media and, and images and, and, you know, the internet and everything has sped up uh, everything that, that comes at us and, and assaults us visually, uh, appropriation and sampling in every field has become uh, rampant. I mean, in architecture, in art, in, 
in, in music, obviously, and also in fashion. Uh, I was often criticized as being a retro designer and of having really created nothing, which actually may be the case. But I never saw that necessarily as my job. My job was to, to, to find, you know, to sort of you know, feel the zeitgeist and, and to take an idea or a mood and turn it into something tangible, which often was something that, that, that had a, uh, a history and a past. Because I think in today's world, we move so quickly that you need to have something that's recognizable so that you feel comfortable with it, so you can ac accept it quickly, but at the same time feels new. So I always tried to put a new spin on things. I don't think that the 70s look of the 90s will really look like the 70s, which, by the way, was inspired by the 30s, uh, you know, when we look back at it 100 years from now. I think each generation tries to put a, sp a spin on things. But so what sort of, do you think? I'm sort of I'm fascinated inside of this and the, the cult of originality, the idea that there, that there is some great original idea. I, don't, I never understood what that was supposed to mean and why we were fixated on the idea that fashion designers of all people were going to have to come up with a great idea. And uh, what, what's been very pleasing to me in the past few years covering fashion is to watch the kind of, I think, necessary and really useful collapse of that into a, into a much more broadly dispersed way of looking at you know, cultural influences and, and the uses of them. And the, in a way, what David was, was referencing about, you know, I, I, forgive me if I don't remember the exact the turn of phrase you used, but the simplicity toward which we're moving, I think that that may be a, you know, a, a release from this, these monumentalized ideas, you know, this, the cult of monumentalizing or, or ideas like originality. And, and, and it will ultimately be better, more fruitful, more productive for everybody when that flattens out, as it has done in the digital world, in music, certainly. And everybody's pulling from all the different areas. And, and perhaps is not so uh, obsessed with a Chanel career or a Lagerfeld career or and it, that, that whole shape of, of uh, creative identity. Don't you think that simplicity might have to be monumentalized, however, in terms, uh, I mean, in terms, you know, to, 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 in order to be able to capitalize on it, to sell it, to, 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 to have it reach yeah, out? It, absolutely. I mean, but it's I, but I think it's such a symptom of today. Is we I, that's have the need to, so. icon, you know, to, everything has to be an icon. And, I think that's so, but also the opposite is so. I have the idea that this, uh, the, 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 the way that the market, it seems to me, from, you know, what, from my vantage is moving, is that there, rather than there being only the sort of you know, mega brands, which I think people always like to want to say are on their way out, there will, of course, be those. But then there will also be this, this you know, sort of virally replicated yeah. microcultures right. that are really, really thriving and that they're not incompatible ideas. No. How that plays out in the market and, and in our closets, I suppose, is, uh, will be, I mean, is a pleasure to watch in a funny way. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about sense of self. If, art, if, if fashion is the ultimate form of self-expression, you know, go with me on this one or, or refute it, but if art is the, if fashion is the ultimate form of self-expression, how as artists, how as designers, do you imbue your art with your frames of reference? And what do you think about this idea of fashion as you know, our collective sense of self? I, mean, I, fashion, I, I don't necessarily feel that it is the ultimate art of, of self-expression. It can be. Certain people choose to make it so. Other people choose to dress in an anonymous way, express themselves in another way. You could say that the fact that they're dressing in an anonymous way is that's, their self-expression. Right, of course, you can keep going in, in that direction. Well, I, was good. Uh, <laughs> I buy that, actually. Uh, but uh, I think that I anyone who's creating in the world can't help but infuse whatever they're creating with their own personal interpretation if you really believe, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know whether you do believe, but we are all sealed in our own uh, you know, skin and everything that we perceive is our own perception filtered through our history, our thoughts, our past, uh, uh, the way we see. How do we know that you really see the way I see, you know, it, visually, even technically? So I think that, that you can't help when you create something but, but put some sort of personal stamp on it. Even if you're copying something, it's still filtering through, through you. From within the industry, though, can you see that in each other? In other words, do you see it when you're reporting on other designers' work? And Tom, do you try and get that across to, um, to your customers and, and to your audiences? If I can use the word audience. Do you want to go I, on? I have to say I'm not sure I understand what you mean. 
Well, does Mucha Prada look like Mucha Prada? A right. black pair of pants from Gucci looks different than a black pair of pants from Mucha Prada, looks different than a black pair of pants from Donatella Versace, looks different from a black pair of pants from Kelly Gray, who I love, who I saw on your screen. <laughs> She's good. Um, I don't know. Do you think it does? Do those things look different from each other? They look different to me, and I think that's the, the you hope that they look different because that's your identity to the consumer. You know, they're buying a black pair of pants, but they want, you know, the Prada pant or the whatever pant, there should be a difference. See, I think Prada is a useful thing to bring up. I have to say I liked all the bad 70s stuff. I, I did I, too. I, I, I even liked the wallpaper in the book. <laughs> she, is, she really is very representative of, of, of the fusion for me, of that, the, the notion that you can, you can sort of break down or, or utilize the fragmented parts and, you know, and still have, have this brand entity. I'm, like, I'm sort of very interested in the way that of course we are in our skin, and of course our, well, how we look is our identity. But I think that this, the, the sort of capital S self, as it's represented in fashion, is becoming much less interesting to everybody. There was a period in, in the post-Logomania days, in, uh, I, 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 you could say the hip-hop community, I think it's probably not a very descriptive term, but when, it, when, the, when everything became generic, like the, the, the thing that you'd want to do was to have nothing that had any logo, and the, a shirt that looked like nothing. It was, you were as anonymous as you could possibly be. And I think that you know, that is a kind of an augury of, uh, of a relaxation of this need to be identified, particularly in a brand way. Mucha Prada does a slightly different thing in that she pulls all these disparate things and in, in a grab baggy way gives you the opportunity to, for, for one thing, to flout old rules. I mean, I don't know if you found that in her designs. Well, I find what she does, uh, well, I love Mitch Prada and I love Prada, but of course, again, for me, I look at the sort of broader marketing aspects of it and Prada is the intellectual brand. Prada <laughs> is the art brand. I was the sexy slut brand. Donatella is, you know, everyone has a, and, and, and in a sense, it, it does, of course, maybe originally come from the original creator. Uh, you know, Chanel, by the way, is not just a brand. It was really a person. Her personality was what made the brand what it was, what gave it a, a sort of difference, and Carl plays on that now and has fused his own personality to it. But uh, I, I think that those things are, you know, part of their function in today's world and part of the reason for the success of those brands is that brands that do are able to capture a certain look and image and become identifiable are the ones that do tend to, to, to develop. But let me say that she's doing what, what's interesting to me in terms of what Prada is doing, and I don't know how this exactly bears on intellectual property, is within the idea of this mega corporation with a, with a very fixed identity, <coughs> she, she is uh, adapting to something that's happening anyway in the marketplace, which is limited editions and doing sort of mm -hmm. a, a creating microcultures within her macro culture. And, uh, and that, I think, is, is affiliated with the idea that, you know, it's affiliated with everything that's happening in the digital world, basically, where, you know, it's, it's about sort of insider knowledge. It's not about having things billboarded with the 3,000 messages a day. It's really about following sinuous uh, uh, paths of information. Which is, I think, the way that people, perhaps I'm, I'm talking in an, ap, in an inapposite way to the point, but I really do feel as if th th this, this is the way that fashion is moving. Does it make any sense at all now? Yes. We're going to we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're follow that back. I just want to just jump back one more step and go back yes. to <clears throat> this idea of inspiration. And that's one of the things that we all have, mm -hmm. keep referring to when we talk about uh, fashion. From where Appropriation is incredibly important in the fashion industry. You couldn't design, you know, I mean, none of us invented a sleeve. We have two arms, you need two sleeves. You know, there's a, uh, appropriation is incredibly important. Uh, but in terms of, you know, as people who are so sensitive to the world around them, and I would suggest both of you are that way, how do you begin to draw from these wellsprings to create? I, I, I'm not a designer, but I, I have to say, I wish, that I, I wish I'd love to be able to do a show of mood boards, designer mood boards, which really sort of are the physicalization of this process. I mean, yes. Tom can, can talk, talk about that. Yeah, but that's not the first step for me. The first step is to look at everything, read every fashion magazine, keep my eyes open, live simultaneously in cities, watch what people are wearing, see every movie, read, you know, try to sort of become so immersed, as you do, with, you know, what's, what's happening so that you say, 
I hate this. I'm sick of it. I'm bored. I don't ever want to see Paris Hilton. Uh, not really. I like Paris Hilton, actually, but I don't ever want to see this again. And then you have to trust yourself as a designer to say, well, what do I want to see? And this is where there's a certain amount of intuition, I think, that comes into play with also a rational, cerebral uh, sort of uh, approach. At least this is the way I work. Then I think, well, okay, I hate yellow. I don't ever want to see yellow again. What do I want to see? What looks fresh? And then I try to sort of look at purple. Purple. Purple looks so fresh. I haven't seen purple. This is a silly simplification of, yeah. of the process. But then I go to the mood board. Once I decide it's purple, then I you know, go into every book, every purple, purple ribbon, purple this, purple uh -huh. silk, purple satin. You know, who wore purple? You stick, you know, and then you do start to sort of form and shape. But I don't Can you know. define mood boards for us a little bit? Oh, a mood board, I'm sorry. Other. And I don't know that everyone necessarily works this way. I mean, my mood board is often in my head and not necessarily. Uh, you know, actually stuck to a wall, but a lot of designers do work this way. There are boards that you put up in your studio if you're working with, you know, two assistants, ten assistants, whatever. Uh, often you will put together, you have a meeting, everyone talks, purple, okay, everyone brings in their purples, you da da da. You put it all up on a wall so that you know that everyone in the studio is thinking the same way because you can talk about the visual, visual things, but nothing really, you know, says it like the actual thing. So you put these things up on a wall, and as you're designing the collection, you often look to it, you think about it, hmm, what would she wear, where would she go, how would she be, what can we do with that, what's a different way of showing purple? And, and you use this as a tool while you're working and developing to, to sort of, and you know, by the way, fashion changes so quickly that by the time sometimes you get to the time that it's ready, you're ready to show a collection, you may be so sick of purple, and it may have moved, the moment may be gone, and you may throw it all out, and, and you know, a week before decide it's all about blue. But, uh, what I have to ask you about, though, and what interests me a lot is, how does everybody get onto purple at the same time? Because there that's is no, David, well, because the clues, <laughs> because this is an, I'm often asked this question, and I think the clues to where we're going to be next year are here now. And to all good sleuths who have, and, and well, people with a certain amount of intuition, they will tend to find the same thing. Because we're not, you know, in order for a design to be successful, it has to be appealing to the mass population. So if it's only appealing to one person, you're never going to sell very much. So the fact that Mucha Prada and you know, Donatella, me, blah, 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 you know, would all come up with the same ideas that this is what we do. At, at the level of color and more subtle details of, of design, it really interests me. At the level that, you were, that David was alluding to uh, with movies, it's, it's billboard plain. I mean, I've seen, yeah. you know, you, you, there, in, in New York at this point, you can sort of you can, you can time the movie opening to the next collection. Cockettes movie, everybody's going to, John Galliano Cockettes. It's going to be glitter and glam, and then everybody pretends that they never saw the movie. So, but, I, but in these other sort of subtler ways, I'm very interested in how that, how that information... You also have to remember that everyone's assistant is sleeping with everyone else's assistant. <laughs> and that this is really the reality, and that you're all getting your fabric from the same sort of big five fabric okay. mills, who are coming and saying, and they'll say to you very quietly, Mucha, Mucha loves this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you can, that usually made me want to say, fine, I don't want that, get it out of here. But, you know, there is a sort of, there is a, you know, like any business, like the film, I mean, come on, one thing happens in Hollywood and everyone's got, you know, I mean, it's just, it's such a, and that, that I hate to sort of demystify it. And, and, no, no, uh, this is what you're here but, for. That is a real aspect of it as well. Well, you know, when we talk about um, the, the importance of the street and we talk about the importance of film and music, and I think what Tom's saying is it's just, it's, it's just chaos theory at work? It's just what? Chaos theory at work, perhaps? Well, I don't think it's chaos, but I think there are a lot of different factors can affecting. We, can we differentiate now, you know, this talk about the street or music and film and its influence on fashion, or is it all so meshed together that it is, a, it is just, an amalgamation of, of a whole variety. That, that's why I wish that one had, I mean, and I regret that I do not have a, a picture of mood boards, which of course lots of designers do not use, but to see these, all the, all the disparate visual images and the way that they sort of meld, really is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is to me quite a fascinating thing and very reflective of the way that this stuff works. You couldn't say it's only this or it's only no. the street or it's only the sales guy with the, you know, with a case full of purple fabric. No, it's all of that. It is all of it. Well, I Don't think, you think I certainly yeah. do yeah. think so. And I also, I have seen designers. Uh, Mark Jacobs is a good example, and certainly king of appropriation by reputation and in truth. And but I, I've seen his process, and when he works with Venetia Scott, who's his sort of 
you know, aide de camp. They, they will take the stuff, and it's very daunting, I have to say, when you, I, I never understood how just physically, never mind mentally and emotionally, you could, anyone could deal with, like the people who came in with the giant boxes of fabrics to look at and choose from among. But they would take these things and then tweak them in these very, very interesting ways. So they would have made all their choices, Mark and Venetia, let's say, and then sort of say, well, those, they would say, no, but we don't, we, we love this pattern, but we don't like, we hate yellow. We, we don't ever want to see yellow again, and then sort of blow it up and change the scale according to whatever else was going on in the culture at that moment, it seems to me. Well, so, so let's try and move from there into issues surrounding intellectual property in mm -hmm. fashion. So here you have now created th this series of works, and whether you've created them you know, in, in collaboration subtly or, 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 you know, or very um, functionally, you have now produced you know, bodies of work, and you have seen bodies of work. And then when you see other people exploring those kind of, um, or exploring very specifically those collections in their own work, whether it shows up in you know, the retail market, whether it shows up in you know, the chain stores, et cetera, et cetera, does that, do you consider that an homage of sorts? Does it bother you? Homage is a funny word, not necessarily applicable there. But homage, okay. I only ever used that word when I was so inspired by something and I would try to sort of interpret it, but you know what, it just never looked as good as the original way and it was the right time for that, so I would put it back out and say, this is an homage. Okay. It's a way to sort of okay. get around. If you call it an homage and you call, you know, then anyway, but back, back to what you were. There's, <laughs> this is a bit of a segue, but there is a great story about Mutual Prada. There's a store in Paris called Didier Ludo yeah, this, and this guy this, runs yeah, a, of course. A, it's a vintage store. It's probably the, certainly the costliest vintage store and it's kind of this yeah. amazing crypt of old clothes. And Mutual Prada went into the store with a friend, uh, Manuela Pavese, Pavese. Uh, who is, anyway, her, works with her very intimately, found a, a, a coat by Cristobal Balenciaga. And Manuela is a maniacal shopper. She's shopping, shopping, shopping. M Mutual is turning this coat inside out and this upside down and, and, uh, and ultimately, of course, does buy the coat. And then the next season, the coat appears exactly as it, w it came out of the shop. The very coat came out in her, in her thing. And that, in a way, is the beauty of, of, of Prada, of Mutual Prada, and also of homage, I guess. Yeah. You can just well, and also the fact that there is no copyright in fashion, right? So that is so in garment design. And so what's perfect here for a well, segue I, for us yeah, is that. I, I agreed with your Chanel uh, quote. I agree with Coco Chanel. I mean, for me, the, the, the moment I'd finished it, you know, I, nothing made me happier than seeing copies uh, of, of what I had done because that meant you did the I'm right very, thing. I, I'm very fascinated to hear you say that in the sense that you as you, yes, but you as Gucci. And because I, I actually come down sort of in a, in a different place vis-a-vis -vis the, the counterfeiting and I don't know that, that it's a moral evil. There's but also a difference in the, you know, for us because we, we of course, you know, <coughs> Gucci, I'm not there any longer, but we have had this, or Gucci had this problem for quite a long time. But there is a difference, and, and that is the quality. And we found after much research that actually, not much research, quite simple research, that our, the counterfeit customer was not our customer, that it, it did diminish our customer's uh, desire to buy a particular bag if she saw copies of it everywhere because it was, it was more available. But they are two different things, and the quality of, which is, Interesting, we were talking briefly earlier yeah. about how this uh, fashion may be quite different from film because, or, or, or the entertainment industry because we're talking about a tangible thing versus an image of something. And, uh, you know, in fashion, you know, a good steak and a bad steak are two very different things. And a cashmere bag and a wool bag, even though they might look the same, are still very different things. Yet in image, I, I don't know whether I, I think there's still ideas in both of those things. And what I love about the whole counterfeit thing is that it's a commentary on the, on the, on the so-called original. And I mean, and that is very free. That, that is something that I, I greatly admire, to see the way that the street can take a thing. And I mean, I, I don't know if it's, if it's made as they now claim, by child laborers, and so one wouldn't <laughs> want to go down that road. But, you know, I, I love that there is that freedom. And clearly people, I, I wouldn't say that this is necessarily in every case clear, but I think that quite often there is, there is a commentary being made on, let's say, logomania mm -hmm. in, in one's decision to buy the $5 bag and not the $1,800 bag, mm -hmm. anyone's. Well, isn't it true, though, that, you know, the person who is going to buy the, 
$200 bag would never been, be able to afford to buy the $1,800 bag. And so can that therefore be considered some kind of complement to the original designer? Because you know, obviously you're, it's coming in at a I different I don't know level. that that's always in every case that, that's true, because I think that a lot of people will, will have made the sacrifice to have the more costly bag. But I really do think they could, I have seen and I've talked to and interviewed people who just decided it was funnier, it was wittier. When, when people started using, uh, pe people started buying counterfeit Gucci logo, so that sort of a vinylized cloth, and, and applying it to the toe caps of Timberland boots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, it's, that's a good thing. Well, if. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great quote. Can we? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I think it is a good thing. And as a designer, I found it flattering to think that, that I had, I mean, I wasn't responsible for the original Gigi logo, but I was responsible for pushing it back into the, into the you know, uh, cultural mix of, of the 90s. So that, that, for me, was exciting to think that, you know, Right, but the difference of the no, between the knockoff and actual piracy, where people are putting on, you know, a, the Gucci logo on something and calling it Gucci when it's not, that's, is there, and I, I don't, that is, is that different. what you're talking about? No, you're no, talking about no. the knockoff that basically looks a lot like the, the original, but, but without the logo. But that is different. That is a trademark, and that is, you know, your name. Right, and, yeah. and earlier, David and I think we're all in that. agreement. That it's a horrible. That that's a different thing than, right. than. Right, right. Um, it's, one thought that occurs to us is, how do you think fashion would be different if it had to obey the c copyright laws? <laughs> There'd be that no fashion. <laughs> yeah, it's true. There'd be no fashion. Nothing else to I say. Don't, I don't know that one can expand on that. There just wouldn't. It wouldn't exist. <laughs> well, if you could imagine, and, and again, as culturalists, if you know, if you could imagine that there would be a different way to look at film and music, because as David Bowyer said, the internet works rather differently. The internet it is this kind of wild west like fashion where more often than not, anything goes um, within, within certain um, social realms. There's, there are levels of social, let's call it decorum. There are social rules that exist and everybody tends to follow those rules. And that seems to be true in fashion, generally speaking. But in music and film, they're much more rigid mm -hmm. uh, in the way we agree what is acceptable behavior and what is not acceptable But behavior. for how long? And I think that probably That's as technology question. advances yeah. and you can really go into television shows and break them up and use, you know, make your own little television show that you want to do with just some characters and not, not others, you'll begin to see some of the stuff that is already obviously clearly happening in, in the music business and to a large extent in fashion. One of the things, Jennifer Jenkins, who is here, who wrote an IP paper for us, Jennifer Jenkins is a uh, law scholar from Duke, she's back there, she makes a very interesting point in her paper where she said that policymakers and um, jurists made a conscientious decision not to protect the fashion industry. Mm. At, okay, sorry, five minutes, I got it. Not to protect, <laughs> the, <laughs> not to protect the fashion industry because they were afraid that it would create monopolies and make it very, very difficult for consumers to have access to goods. Yet it seems that the po same policymakers feel fairly comfortable allowing that kind of more rigid structure to exist in music and film. And I just thought, A, were you aware of that? And B, do you find that curious? And what do you think? I just say that except, <laughs> with, except at the global brand level, I think that one of the things that I'm disposed to do is to look at the historical ownership of, of, of fashion and the manufacture of fashion. And since it's something that was mainly women's work, and the business was mainly dominated by gay men and women. It was really sort of a little bit outside. I don't know that it was, you can look to the jurists for their high-mindedness here. I think it was really beneath people's regard. Nobody really wanted to bother because it was. Or it was, it, it, the thought was that it was clothing, and clothing was a necessity like food was, and it would be unfair to restrict the availability of clothing. I mean, you know. I think there are some chefs. Entertainment is a different, is a different uh, Thought. I'm, I'm not saying necessarily what fashion has evolved into today. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about this, the history of this, to. Right. Right. But clothing and fashion, I think, should not be mistaken. It's true. They are other. different. <laughs> yes, they keep, that's what we're talking about. Fashion with a little M. Um, I, uh, Katie is, is. Okay. One. More, no, okay. I just have one more quick question that I just want to throw out. Um, can we talk a little bit about? 
copyright restrictions in other countries and how the fashion industry works globally as compared to the United States. Do you guys have any comment that you'd like to share with us about that? Uh, Do you find a difference between No, not prior necessarily. Art? I have to say off the top of my head, I can't recall an instance where we would have had a copyright problem in one country and not in another. Uh, however, in France, and it's very interesting what you brought up about uh, le smoking, uh, having worked uh, at Yves Saint Laurent for a long time and lived in Paris for a long time, the French do have a very funny uh, regard for Saint Laurent. I mean, he really is, is God. And uh, uh, the, the, there is maybe a slightly different um, idea of uh, proprietary rights in, in France. Even with the paparazzi, I believe that the, someone has to take three pictures of you or four pictures of you in order to be able to use one, which means that you consented to Tom, standing. Tom, you would know this. But, but, <laughs> no, I, I remember it from, from Princess Diana and, and all of that sort of coming up. There are tighter rules, I believe, in France about paparazzi photography than there are other ways, which sort of relates back to this, this idea of proprietary rights, I believe. But, I want to get, um, and Katie is cueing me, we need to give the audience an opportunity to chime in here. I'm sure there are many questions uh, that people would like to ask. So, is there, there's a roving mic, I believe. Would people like to raise your hand? Booth? Um, would you like to identify yourself when you... Um, we know Booth. I'm Booth Moore from the LA Times. I'm curious, Tom, sort of from uh, an intellectual property standpoint, is there any time when you take a lot of influences from different places, I don't know, you know, from celebrities from the past or other designers, and you feel the need that you have to, or you felt the need that you had to rein yourself in before you put it out there for fear that maybe someone was going to say, oh, that's so derivative or not, whatever. Not fear, because I, I, um, I think it's a matter of, uh, uh, I don't know what the word would be. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really feel good about copying something completely literally. You know, I, I think I, I want to always try to challenge myself to reinterpret it or to alter it uh, in a way that does make it somewhat fresh. And as I said, if I did feel the need to interpret it fairly literally, I would, my conscience would, I would ha conscience, I would have to say this is an homage. Which again, th there's a different skill to being a fashion designer, which has nothing to do with originality. It has to do with knowing that you know there's a right time for the right thing, and there's a wrong time for the same thing. Uh, what's right today may not be right in five years. And there's a skill to know, to say, you know what, this thing that someone else did here is exactly right for now and can excite people just as much. So if you're doing something that literally, I think you have to say it is an homage, but yet I still <laughs> have the, the, you know, I still believe that this is the right time for that homage. Can you give an example of maybe something that you, you know, like a bamboo shoe or a bamboo handle bag where, you know, what the process was? Bamboo shoe and bamboo bag, no. Uh, but I, I did one time on a runway in about 1997 literally put Yves Saint Laurent's little chubby fox coats from, uh, you know, uh, from his 1973 30s collection on the runway. And I did openly say, you know, this is very Saint Laurent. Which collection, by the way, bombed when Saint Laurent did it? Yes, of course it Huge did. Bomb. It did. It did. Often, sometimes, when you make a major sea change like that in, in, in fashion, it will bomb because it takes sometimes our eye, the consumer's eye, a, a, a bit to catch up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Barbara Kramer from Designers and Agents. And so I work with a lot of emerging designers. And in the scope of pirating fashion, um, you know, at the level that you're at, it's, it's one thing to take from, like, say, Muccia going into a vintage store in Paris and taking this little coat and the designer, I'm assuming, is dead, yes, no longer dead. around to, you know, dead. comment on it. Um, but I work with a lot of smaller designers, and when, um, as I've seen happen, bigger designers will find a design from someone who's, um, you know, not so famous, and take that design and then include it in their collection. And this happens, you know, I think often enough. And I'm wondering what your position is on that. It's one thing to be influenced or, you know, take a design and use a derivative form of it in a large collection from someone whose, you know, design has come and gone. But to take something from a younger designer and then include it when, you know, I've heard them say, I can't believe this is in so-and-so's collection. You know, I, I, I've sold... 40 of them, and now they've sold 3,000 of them. And right. 
what your position is I mean, on it, that. It's funny because I, obviously morally it feels sort of like a no-brainer, but I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, for example, a design collective in New York called As4. And they, had, sure. they did a, a circular bag right. that was very distinctive. And they had a, an unbelievably daffy uh, design manifesto behind everything that they did. They're this great. Bag was I love part them. Of it. They're great. And their bag really, a, 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 a much more famous designer, more or less, copied the bag and made a lot of money off the Ooh. bag. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a larger designer. Anybody else? Okay, Katie, well, thank you very right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.